Welcome again, everyone, to the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast. As always, you can support these videos and the audio recordings by heading over to patreon.com slash tawahado. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash t-e-w-a-h-i-d-o. And as I have said on many an occasion, if you are not allergic to reading, you can sign up to aksum.substack.com. That's a-k-s-u-m.substack.com. And one of the authors that you will find there is Deacon Mahari Zamalak. And Dethana, how are you? How are you? How are you? Okay. Amen. Amen. May his honor expand. Amen. 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 So one of the articles you have written, you've also had audio recordings on there. That maybe we can discuss at, at later dates as a friend of the show was called Before Egypt and Rome, There Was Syria. And you get into this group called, uh, and excuse my source, uh, but <laughs> B'nai wa b'nat Kama. But before you talk about them, you mention the likes of Saint Benedict of Nursia and Saint Anthony of the Egyptian wilderness or desert. So before we talk about the Benai and the Benat. Can you tell us a little bit about Saint Benedict and, and Saint Anthony? Um, uh, all right, Saint Benedict of Nursia. Uh, he is like the considered the founder, the founder of, of Western monasticism. Um, even though you know there was Basil before him, and uh, we can also consider Alexandria as part of the Western Roman Empire, like the Western uh, Roman Empire's cultural um, sphere, like Alexandria, I think, and I still believe that, uh, can be included in the Western, particularly at that time, uh, third, second, uh, third century, fourth century, Alexandria can be counted as part of the Western uh, Roman culture in a state of uh, the Semitic culture that you see in the Middle East and what we call today the, the Near East. So Benedict of Nursia was uh, the founder of Western monasticism or considered, he's still considered as the founder of Western monasticism. And he, in a way, he, he was not really a founder uh, because he is not like the first, first person who started the ascetical practices in the Western Hemisphere or in the Western churches. There were people before him, like you will see Augustine, for instance, like who uh, tried to imitate Anthony of Egypt. Or, um, as, as I said earlier, you have Basil, Basil the Great, even though he... Uh, can be considered as kind of uh, a mediator. We can consider the Cappadocians as mediators between the East and the West. Yeah, uh, but so, I, so the funny thing, just to highlight what you've been saying, mm -hmm. Alexandria is a cosmopolitan area on the northern coast of Africa, and yet it sits in this region which people refer to as, you know, the Eastern Mediterranean now. So it's mm -hmm. it's connected via the Mediterranean to all of these places that would be considered the West. The Romans successfully colonized not only the territory, but the mentality of the Eastern part of the empire. And so thus what was considered the East, what we call Byzantium, the Byzantines themselves refer to themselves as Rumi, as Romans. And, and so there's that weird interplay where they were conquered by them, but then they identified as them and kept that eastern part of the Roman Empire going until they themselves are conquered by the Ottomans. So you're you're saying that these kind of uh, borders and the Cappadocian fathers, if I'm not mistaken, are in modern day Turkey, but maybe mm -hmm. the greater kind mm -hmm. of Syrian desert. But their language would have been Greek. The Alexandrians yes. language would have been Greek originally, and and some of them would have known Copt, and and later Copt would, Coptic would would uh, expand. Benedict, if I'm not mistaken, is is one of the Latin fathers. So, yes. so at least yes. linguistically speaking, uh, you know some of those people might be border, but but their writings are found in Greek versus in Latin. 
Mm -hmm. uh, probably, yeah. The, uh, I think most of the time, why when when we say West today, it's uh, it refers to the Latin speaking uh, part of the world. I think, and That's later the Anglo-Saxon, the German and the English. Yeah, because they are the inheritors of the Latin civilization or the the Latin culture. Uh, let's say so. Yeah. Uh, that, that's what we I think we refer to today as the West. Um, yeah, so Benedict, um, he was mm, he was a founder in a way, like he was an innovator. Like it's better to say he was an innovator. Like all these monastic uh, figures that we have, like St. Anthony of um, Egypt uh, or Pacomius uh, or Benedict of Nursia, like they were not founders, honestly they were innovators of what already exists. They took it to another step. Uh, so Benedict, before Benedict comes, all these ascetical groups were around Europe, okay, uh, around Rome, and like ascetical practices were known in the church, in the Latin speaking church, in the Greek speaking, like all over the place, in Syriac speaking churches. And, and, and in Egypt, and uh, not only in Alexandria, but all the way down the Nile Valley, you have all these uh, monastic. Uh, I mean, ascetic. It's not. It's not. Uh, it's come, uh, like it's not good to call them monastic at this time because it's a little. Uh, yeah, differentiate major. that for us because we have, if I'm not mistaken, the prophet Elijah, certainly Jesus, John the Baptist, and Paul as mm -hmm. sort of what are called proto monastic figures although only a certain type of monasticism which we could you know get into <laughs> <laughs> yeah but when you say monastic you are you are like you are that term is based on the word monk mm -hmm. monos and that only comes later mm -hmm. before that you have the anchorites the cenobites and there are there, there there are also different groups called uh, the apotacticos. The apotacticos. These are are they monks? Can we call them monks by today's standards? Maybe, <laughs> but are they monastics? Eh, I would I like the so way safe, of safe, safe, safe to say ascetic, which is different than ascetic, and to to really not get confused, at least celibate. And some of these yes, individual they are communities. Yes, they were celibates. And the the, the apotacticos, for instance, they, they were living among the people and they were not even living in community. Some of them live in community, some of them don't. Some of them own property, some of them don't. Uh, the, the, monastic, the, the monastic, the history of monasticism in the church, it's not something that's uh, fixed. Like it's, it begins at some point and then it just, flourishes. No, it did not begin like that. <laughs> there were different ascetical groups beginning um, from third century, at least we see in the church, these ascetical groups trying to imitate uh, uh, more ascetical figures like uh, Elijah or um, John the Baptist, as you refer to. But most of all, Jesus himself. They were trying to uh, to embrace more ascetical practices to grow in spiritual life in the likeness of Jesus uh, by uh, particularly controlling the senses, like self-control, fasting, a, a little intense fasting, and a, a little uh, more intensive prayer life than uh, um, uh, just an a regular Christian. So these people, these people, some of them were celibates, some of them were not, some of them were married. Some of uh, the, the ascetics that we see in the church, like it's it's quite like it's it's very likely that we also had some people who were still married but who still practiced asceticism in their own houses. Um, so. It is not, it, it was diverse. It was not something monolithic. It, it, it was diverse. What happens with these founders like Anthony of Egypt, Pacomius of Egypt, or uh, Benedict of Nursia, or Basil, what happened is they took it to another step. 
they gave it a form, a different form. Before Anthony, mon a kind of the, the ascetic practices, when you want to be an ascetic, you go out to probably the peripheral areas of your village or your town, you start living there by yourself and probably providing for yourself. And you are not totally, completely, absolutely detached from the village that you, you grew up or you, you lived before. You are still connected to the village. You are still connected to your city, your town. However, because you want to practice this intensive life of prayer, you want to have a, a little separated space for yourself from the community. So as even the, the, um, the life of Anthony or the, the version of the, the folklore we have about Anthony in the Ethiopian tradition tells you, Anthony lived very close to the, the, the town where he grew and where he lived uh, until a woman comes and gives him a child. <laughs> and she, uh, God bless her, she kicked him out. <laughs> she kicked him out of that place and he went deeper into the desert and he became Father Anthony, Appa Anthony, Antonius. So these are innovators and so was Benedict of Nursia when he came in the fifth century. He comes very late, late fifth century. And he was kind of depressed. And don't forget that this time Rome has fallen into the hands of the barbarians. Rome has fallen and the people have become so corrupt from his perspective. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, nothing really seems to be holding together. So this guy, this young boy was very depressed with what he was seeing. So everything is just going, to, everything seems to go down the drain. And this is very sad and very sad. So he went to this uh, Monte Cassino. That's that's the, the, the monastery that um, will later, it, it still exists in Italy. And uh, he started living there and praying there. And then some people come and start to gather around him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He was trying to save himself before doing anything else. And then people started uh, getting attracted to him and as they get attracted to him, now here comes the need for rules and regulations, how to, because monastic life, like in the monastic lives, imagine you are living, trying to have a peace and a quiet by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> going to some solid, uh, a place of solitude and people are gathered to you. And these people, you have no idea where they are coming from. Everybody has a different background. Some of them probably were soldiers. Some of them were probably thieves, as we see in, in the, the Apotegmata Patru in Egypt. Some of them were educated. Some of them were completely uneducated, unlater. And, some of them were pious, some of them were vagabonds. <laughs> so <laughs> you have all these people now getting attracted and, uh, you know, sort of, um, uh, gathered around you. So how, like, how do you deal with these group of people? It is very interesting when you look at the earlier monastic rules. It's very, very interesting um, how life could be very, very... Uh, uh, full of tension, let's say, let's put it that way. Yeah, life could be like full of tension because of the diverse personalities that you have in this very small place and everybody's on everybody's face the whole time. <laughs> you can't get rid of the person because even though he, he makes you very uncomfortable, you can't get rid of him because he's, he lives with you. He's fully, totally, completely, absolutely accepted by the community just like you. <laughs> so what do you do with that? Like, how do you deal with it? So ben the genius of Benedict is he synthesizes the existing, like the, he had the Pacomian rule, then you had, uh, you also had other rules that kind of seemed like the Pacomian rule. Whatever rule that existed, St. Benedict of Nursia synthesized it and tried to give to uh, his community, the rule to live by. He, he was not planning to have this order of Benedict. No, he, he, that was not his plan. The only thing he was thinking was, 
okay, I need to give these people a good um, kind of constitution that will like that will synchronize their movements and intentions and actions. So, yeah, and he, he did a good job. Now, we were thought we were planning to talk about Benai Kiyama. Why are we talking about I know, about we will. We will. No, this, is good, this is good background. And, and Benedict <laughs> must have done something right because uh, Bishop Barron, an auxiliary bishop where I live in Southern California, made a documentary about him recently that I got to watch. And I've, I've had Facebook friends and I've seen other people who are not even Catholic priests who are trying to live in communities, even if they're married people, that at least in some way represent the rules set down by Benedict so many years ago in, in the 400s or so. And then you have, um, you know, as you said, the, the official order of his name in which priests are practicing in that way. But, but that's all to say, in your title, you basically said, yeah, 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 people know about Egypt. Yeah, 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 people know about Rome. But one of the many languages you study is, is Syriac, which is a Semitic language. It's important to note that you also have some degree of studying Hebrew and Arabic, which are very close to it and more distantly related Giz and Amharic, which you know both in depth. So I think that helps you, even with my my limited foray into these languages, just from hearing Benai and Benat Kiyama, I, I recognize the Kawama as standing or arising in the latter part. And I, I recognize from the common Ben Adam or, or son of Adam or son of man or son of the groundling, the Ben uh, is son in Hebrew, so I imagine that this is something like sons and and daughters. Can you can you tell us about the benai benat uh, Kama? Sure. Uh, so uh, you are right. Uh, like you see, this uh, it's composed of these two words, benai and benat, uh, uh, benai and Kama. Benat, benai, benai, uh, benai, benai or benat means um, children. Okay. Benai is male children and Benat is female children. By the way, the in the Western Syriac tradition, the wives of priests are st uh, still called Bat Kiyama. That 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 the name st uh, stuck and is it's that still that the, the standing house. Uh, the Bat no Bat Kiyama is the daughter no the daughter of oh the uh, daughter okay. Kiyama. So now the, uh, here comes what Kiyama means. Kiyama comes from this um, word called Kawa. It's a, sem a common Semitic word. You will see it almost, I have seen it in almost every Semitic language that I have, I have uh, looked into. Kawama, it means to, st it can mean to stand, to rise. Literally, it means to stand. Like th that would be the first uh, um, the dictionary meaning that you'll find, but it can also mean resurrection. Yes. yes, not just to stand from your seat or something, but can also mean resurrection. It can also mean covenant. So uh, these people, we do not know much about them. The Benat Kiyama, the the Benai Kiyama. We do not know much about them. The only uh, little information that we get from them, uh, that, that we get about them, is uh, comes from Afrahad, the Persian sage, who lived uh, late uh, third century and early, uh, kind of to mid uh, fourth century. He is a contemporary of Saint Ephraim the Syrian. So. Saint Afrahad and Saint, uh, Saint Af uh, Ephraim, they lived at a time when the Bnei Kiyama were active and um, fully alive in the uh, Syrian, uh, Syriac-speaking church. Who are these people? They also have another name, the Bnei Kiyama, the children of the resurrection, or the children of the, um, the covenant. We can translate it in both ways. Uh, these people also had another name called Ihidaya. It seems to have, at least Afrahad seems to refer to them as Ihidaye. Ihidaye comes from this Wahid, Ahad, one. And 
like Uhud, Ahad, Ahad. So, Ihidaye or Benat or Benai Kiyama, this term tells you that they seem to have some kind of covenant to live the Christian life more intensively than the regular Christians. Uh, the word Ihidaye also seems to indicate that some of them were living by themselves. These were not, they were not considered monks or nuns. They were just called the Ihidaye or the Bar or Bar Kiyama or Bat Kiyama. Uh, a son of the Kiyama or a, a, a daughter of the Kiyama. Some of them lived in communities, kind of in communities. The communities might be uh, very helpful, especially if they are living by themselves, you know, to manage the household and uh, all the details of everyday life, you know. It's, it's uh, much easier when you have someone instead of trying to deal with it all by yourself. So some of them seem to have lived together some, it, it seems that at least some of them, some of the bad kiamas and some of the bar kiamas, they used to live together. co -ed. Yeah, because we know about this because uh, Afrahat writes against it. He tells, like, he, he gives this role to, to the men and to the women also. Like, he tells the men first, like, look, you are supposed to live by yourself. <laughs> so don't bother the women. <laughs> it's a, it's a, that kind of like, and he also goes into a kind of um, trying to scare uh, the men. It's very interesting if you read, like, if you read his uh, writings about the Blai Kiyama, he tells the men like, look, it is through the woman that the man fell down. <laughs> so you better avoid the man. You better avoid the woman, he says. Then after trying to scare the men away from the women, then he turns to the women and he tells them, look, <laughs> when one of those guys asks you, like, let's live together, life is going to be easy. It's going to be much more comfortable than by living yourself. Look, tell them, I am already betrothed to Christ. So if I, I start serving you, my, uh, my bridegroom, it, like he tells them to, to use this term, my bridegroom is going to give me my letter of divorce. <laughs> <laughs> so like tell them, like, well, I, I don't want to anger my bridegroom. I don't want to get a letter of divorce for, for, uh, from my bri bridegroom. So you stay in your honor and I will stay with mine. <laughs> Amen. And this, and this particular <laughs> bridegroom has shared some comments about letters of divorce in general too. Yes, he did. <laughs> yes, he did. And uh, they were, and uh, the, it was not um, a kind one, was it? <laughs> No, no. And it's funny because it's in the passage discussing eunuchs for the kingdom of which mm -hmm. this Christian community would would be a part of. Now, as, as we get to wrapping up about this community, I have to ask you before we, we get out of here, is this just a curiosity of yours as you study St. Afarat, the Persian sage. And for those who don't understand, he's called Persian because he's within that area Persian. which crossed the border that is the Persian Empire. And yet he's not speaking Farsi, but he's speaking an Aramaic, which is the literary Syriac that we've been discussing. So is it just some added curiosity as you studied this historical figure? Or do you think that there's anything amidst the life of the children of the covenant that could be applicable for the Aksumite Christian communities we're establishing today in the nation state of Ethiopia or in the diaspora? Uh, oh, I think 
it's not just curiosity. I uh, I come from Ethiopia, so I'm a pragmatic academic. <laughs> I can say, oh, I'm a pragmatic student. I'm not. I'm. I don't like to call myself an academician. No, I like to call myself a student because. At That's least you'll, I, I, you'll have to permit me to call you a senior student uh, <laughs> in the Japanese tradition, a senpai in the Ethiopian school of traditional, in the, in the Ethiopian traditional schooling, the askasai. Yes, the system <laughs> well, of the askasai and the adrash of the senior student and the junior student. So long as there is someone to 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 give me some kasala, I don't mind to to <laughs> to help uh, the, my junior ones with my with their kasala. So long as I have some senior above me, I don't mind to have some juniors. The one thing necessary is to have some senior <laughs> to look up to. So um, coming back to your question, do I uh, do I see the the the, the this uh, way of li their life? as uh, somehow beneficial to the current Ethiopian Christians or any any Christian living uh, these days? Uh, I think I do. I think I do. I think that's why I study, I try to study the church fathers, uh, particularly from this, these uh, centuries, like third, fourth, fifth, sixth centuries. These, these centuries are very interesting to me. Uh, particularly because there is a lot to learn from them. Um, uh, to, to move beyond um, uh, or to reevaluate or even to understand the medieval or, yeah, the medieval, the, the Christianity that which we have received f through the medieval ages what the, the European historians call it, the medieval ages. I'm not sure whether we can apply that particular term to uh, non-European settings, but- We can call it, I, I recently called it in an article I wrote just today, the Solomonic dynastic period. You can say something like that as well, or something else. Yeah, yeah, or yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, that, that also, I uh, like, yeah, the Solomonic dynasty. I don't know why we call it Solomonic dynasty. Um, like, who, who gave who gave that dynasty that particular name? You can throw the <laughs> uh, the appellate self described in front if you want to be. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, yeah, most of the things I think might be. Yeah, I, I, at least for uh, I I will have to reevaluate it for myself. Like to to rethink. Like, why why do we say this again? Like, uh, why? Yeah, you know, the self-described self Solomonic dynastic period. I mean, otherwise it becomes very difficult, you know. Yeah, to, to communicate. Yeah. Anyways, yeah, you understand what I mean. So to understand what we have received, we need to we need to go past that age, move all the way back and try to look what got into that age, what that age received first, and what was the treasure. And when we look at that treasure there is a lot of beauty a lot of intensity a lot of reflection depth and breadth in it as uh, as i was pointing to you earlier the, the word bnai like the the, the the children of the covenant or the children of uh, the resurrection it seems to refer directly probably to luke 20 36 where the Jesus Christ calls the people who, uh, uh, who who lived in the resurrection as the children of God and the children of resurrection. The resurrection. So that's what they were focused on: the resurrection, the parousia, the resurrection when the bridegroom comes we are supposed to meet him as the undefiled, unblemished, pure bride. And for this, they devised different ways of practicing and uh, the Christianity and trying to grow into the likeness of God, like from the image into the likeness. You know, we were created in the image of God, then we have to grow into the likeness of God. And that likeness of God, that 
icon to the U, you know, the, the icon of God is Jesus himself. So to grow into him, they devised all these ascetical practices against the cultural practice around them, which was pagan and man-centered. They tried to practice a way of life which is more focused and centered on God, on meeting God. So they tried to practice this life. Some of them practiced it throughout their lives. Some of them, particularly in the later centuries, like fourth, fifth centuries, when the B'nai Kiyama, this form of uh, asceticism, got, got swallowed up by the Egyptian version of monasticism, this uh, B'nai Kiyama, B'nai Kiyama style of life became a kind of the novitiate where you get trained to get into the monastic life. When you're a brother so, or a sister before you're a mother or a father. Exactly. So they used this to, to, to grow in the, like, it, in the God-centeredness of Christianity. Christianity is a God, God-centeredness. It's a God-centered life. Not me or the, the, the political economy or empire or state or nationality or flag or culture. No, it's God. God is at the center. That's why we have the Eucharist at the center. Who, like, where we meet God and God meets us. We come into God and God come in us. That's God-centeredness that Christianity preaches. And I do believe that that's what we need to refocus by looking at these groups, by the way they lived, what they have written, what they have transmitted. We have to look back and, hmm, this is what they were about. This is what was given to us. And I think unless we do that, we might miss the meaning of most of the, most of the things that we have been given. We don't understand monasticism. We don't understand fasting. We don't like. I have met so many people who think because this is fasting season, I can I can I want to I, I really want to speak about this. <laughs> just it just came to my mind. Fasting is not hunger strike. <laughs> It is that hunger strike. It's not a practice where you try to force God to do something for you. No. And prior, the prayer is not a petition where you try to twist the hand of God. No. It doesn't work like that and it has never been like that. This is the pagan way of looking at things. We do not, like the Christian way of seeing things is not like this. We don't fast to force God to do something for us. No. Fasting is like going the extra mile to meet someone or the necessary miles to meet someone whom you have missed. It is a love relationship. Between, it's supposed to be a love, loving relationship between God and us. Fasting is to recenter one's, one's life back to God. That's why in our church we have this tradition of going to Kandasi during during um, the, the, the fasting seasons. You go to Kandasi. Why? Because you are trying to recenter your life back to where it's supposed to be. Because there are so many distractions. As C.S. Lewis says, we are the most forgetful creatures <laughs> on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> and he really is right. I do believe he is right in this in this regard. That's why the church gives us the liturgy, the anamnesis, you know, that to, to re keep reminding you, like, don't forget it. Rewind it, replay it, remember it. Center yourself around that reality and everything else will fall in line. Not where you want it to be, but where it's supposed to be. 
And fasting is seeing this perspective. Like, oh, I might get, I have been distracted by so many things. So, uh oh, it is time to go back to the center, go back to the root, go back to the source, go back to the center of your existence. And once, when that, once that happens, your life is not going to disintegrate because that's what the devil does to you, diabolos. He just splits you and just throws you into pieces, you know, here and there. And that's what, what often the, the distractions in life do to us, right? And fasting takes us back. Like, no, 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 no. Don't get distracted. Come back. Come back to the center. Come back to the center. Focus on God through his word, through the liturgy of the church. So if you do that, you will grow into the likeness of Christ. Of course, it's not going to be easy. Of course, it's going to be a cross. Of course. Don't you know that you, you are baptized into the death of Christ? <laughs> so, <I mean. laughs> so yeah. it's not going to be easy, but that's what's supposed to be. And I think that's what we see in the B'nai Kiyama, B'nai Kiyama, these all ascetical groups which gave birth to the monastic uh, movement that we'll see in the later centuries. Sorry, I took, I, I, I took time, I think. No, it was this beautiful. Is <laughs> this is beautiful. Glory to God for all things. His paper is before Egypt and Rome. There was Syria. You can find his paper as well as some audio recordings, some in Amharic, some in English at aksum.substack.com. Thank you so much again for joining the program, uh, Deacon Mahari. And I believe next time we will meet again to discuss a little bit more about St. Afarat, uh, Afrahat. I'll be very glad to do so. I love Afrahat. I mean, there is so much I need to learn also, but we'll learn as we talk. <laughs> they are not too, you know, in the unintelligible not, things. So that's right. They are not exclusive to one another. They're not mutually exclusive. We'll do both. We'll, 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 uh, we will. Inshallah. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, the Egyptians, uh, inshallah. <laughs> yeah. We will. We will discuss and learn. Yeah, exactly.